with Daniel uh, about some new ideas about mode sitting. Daniel. Should be. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, so, let me fix this first. I'll be talking a little bit about the new mode set code that the yeah, good just merged for uh, the DRM i950 and kernel module. And kind of the special thing is up to now, all kernel mode setting drivers use the common CRTC helpers to implement the KMS API, the IOCTLs. But now i950 has their own custom framework to implement the IACTL. So the interface for user space is still exactly the same, just the internal implementation. I figured oh, it would be interesting to kind of detail a little bit why we couldn't use the CRTC helper code anymore and what exactly the new code looks like. Damn. Yeah, okay. But first, first a little bit about naming things because uh, the CRTC helper code and new code kind of name things different, so I might mix up things a little bit. Our CRTC code calls, uh, has some prepare and commit hooks. Essentially, they enable and disable things. Well, the other way around, prepare, disable things, and commit any of things again. Uh, we call things at Intel, well, at Intel, the encoder thing is usually called a port and the CRTC is usually called the pipe. So, yeah, that's just in case I, I'll probably mix them up all over the place. So, let's first look at the CRTC hull percent and the kind of basic assumptions that thing makes. CRTC hull code has a very simple split between the encoder block and the, and the CRTC block. Namely, it, it kind of assumes that there's just a dumb pixel pipe in between, and as long as the CRTC is enabled, you can enable and disable the, the encoder. That's kind of the only constraint it ever uh, imposes. So you can disable a bunch of encoders that are getting pixels from a CRTC, let the CRTC keep on running, enable these encoders on another CRTC. That's all fine with with the, uh, the CRTC helper function. Kind of the yeah, the basic assumption. And, and hence, it's also rather simple for the driver interface. There's just a, uh, one enable, disable function for CRTC and the encoders and then additional node set functions to kind of exchange all the timing parameters in the registers. Well, now, let's look a bit, little bit at what kind of problems that poses for Intel. And the first part is it's not flexible enough. I mean, we have lots of kind of different corner cases in the hardware. Uh, I'll go through a, a few examples here. One is uh, the C CPU EDP port has its own special uh, PLL that is assigned to the port and not to the pipe. And the strange thing, or the special thing here is that on the enable sequence, we first have to enable the PLL, then we can enable the pipe, and afterwards we can enable uh, the actual display port and do the link training. So we actually need two callbacks here. Uh, a kind of similar thing is, is the LVDS. Uh, here we have to enable the LVDS pin pairs without any clocks. So we have to do that before we switch on the main PLL on the pipe. So again, we need kind of a different place uh, some, some callback, and the one single callback that the CRTC helper exposes uh, is just not good enough. The next one is, is for Haswell. The entire uh, sequence w w that Haswell has a completely new way of enabling ports and all. We now have unified HDMI and DisplayPort ports all on the CPU die. So they switched around the enabling. So there you first have to do link training, you have to first enable the port in a way, and only afterwards uh, you can enable the pipe that feeds the port. So completely the other way around to what the CRTC helper actually expects, which wants to switch on the CRTC first, and then enable the port. 
On the other hand, CRGC Harper is, I'm confused about this. It's also too, uh, not flex, uh, too flexible, actually, because it presumes that these things, the encoders and CRGCs, are rather independent. So it just disables them as it sees it fit. For example, if you switch an encoder from one pipe to another, it disables the encoder, leaves the pipe running, enables the other pipe, enables the encoder. So the problem is we don't really have a fixed disable sequence. And the second thing is disable is called like everywhere. And at tons of times, like at the end of each uh, mode set sequence, the CRTC hardware just disables everything again. So we actually have in our code a lot of state tracking to check whether we disable things again, because if you disable, for example, display port twice, it gets really angry, because it confuses the display link training uh, state machine in the hardware. So we have a few problems, and I went about to fix that, especially because my new shiny machine here was broken, because of the disable sequence. And the first thing, well, maybe we, we worked around most of these things. Like I said, the disable sequence, we, we just add tons of state tracking things to not disable things twice. Uh, for all the, the multiple ways we, we need to call down into encoder code, we just sprinkle every common CRTC code with uh, ugly things that check whether a specific encoder is connected and do the magic that we need to do. Uh, but yeah, kind of the disable code was thing that pushed us over the edge because with this EDP here, if you disable things the wrong way, the EDP connect to kind of get stuck on the old pipe and nothing works really anymore. So rewrite was on the way. First thing that kind of uh, prepare thing just to gain some better overview of what's actually going on. The first thing I did was simplify the DPMS code because essentially all the Intel hardware only supports on and off. So all the intermediate standby and suspend things are kind of overkill. The only place where we support that is for old VGA outputs on old hardware. So all the new hardware doesn't even support that anymore on, on VGA. So that resulted in some, some stupid decisions in in our code because we kind of had to presume that the encoder was still needing the pixel clock and that everything in standby suspense. So we only turned off the pipe uh, when the DPMS state was off, which was kind of wasting uh, power for everyone with modern outputs. So the first thing I did uh, move the DPMS state control into the connector. So the connector decides, well, what actually need, which means almost every connector clamps it to off, say for when it's on. And then the pipe state is kind of derived from that. The other thing is kind of, we, we do not really support hardware cloning on Intel, save for some really obscure combination that no one really cares about. So. I simplified that piece of the code too by only handling the cloning and the connectors and outputs that actually support cloning. And the end result is that the pipe state is just on off. It looks through all the connected, the enabled outputs, uh, checks whether anyone is in not in, in DPMS off state, and in that case enables the entire pipe. And yeah, so that was kind of prepare stage, just to simplify the code a little bit. So the next thing was kind of to fix up the, the mode set sequence. Like I said, we need way less flexibil flexibility in the, in the disable path to not screw up the hardware. We needed more callbacks to kind of do the right thing for different encoders. Um, so the plan is, or the implementation is, we have one CRTC callback that for a specific configuration goes through all the callbacks, goes through the entire sequence and controls it in kind of a per platform way. So if you have like special things done in special handling, we can all move them there. 
So, for example, for the EDP, we now have a pre-enable and a post-disable hook to disable the EDP PLL at just the right time. And because the CRTC helper is actually a per-platform callback, we can move that around. So, if Haswell needs that enable disable state at a slightly different point, we can just move it around and things very so. Uh, the, the sec yeah, like I said already, we, we now have a fixed enable disable sequence, so we don't do just a little bit of encoded disabling, then a little bit of CRTC disabling, and a few things in between. If we decide to disable a pipe, we, di we disable the entire pipe, including all connectors, encoders, no matter what the state change actually is. And then we go about and set up the new thing completely new. And yeah, like I said, we have... Uh, quite a few more encoded callbacks and they'll probably grow a few more so now that kind of requires that we rework the code quite a little bit um, the thing is we the CRT cell helper essentially computed the new state of all the linkings between CRTC to encoded to output and then went about to disable things set up new things and then enable everything again the problem with that is, on, on the disable sequence, we do not know anymore the current harvest state. So we do not know what we actually have to disable and which sequence. So um, the solution was to push that output uh, change, uh, the, the configuration changes, down in the code sequence below the disable step, so that we could still uh, disable everything with the old state correctly, disable all the encoders because we still knew what was actually enabled. Then we switch over to the new state and set up things with the new state. That's a bunch of nice uh, advantages. I mean, uh, it allows you to, to simplify the state checking because essentially a disable sequence for mode set is exactly the same like DPM as off because we, don't, we haven't changed any of the software state yet. So we can just simplify the checks there, actually add a few more checks because now it's guaranteed that the CRTC is actually enabled still before we, while we disable it. Uh, the second pool was kind of, that was the really ugly part of the conversion because there are multiple stages in the mode set sequence and I had to kind of push that down step by step and every on every step fix up the code so that everything that needs the new state for example to check whether the mode is valid or anything like that that needs to check the new staged output configuration whereas all the disabled things still needed to check the old current configuration yeah but with, with that infrastructure we can nicely disable everything in the correct sequence that we enabled uh, that we implemented in the first step, save for one exception, and um, that's boot up. I mean, at boot up, we get some random state left behind by the buyers. And if you now go about and just disable things randomly, we haven't solved the problem because the hardware will hate this. So, there are kind of two solutions to that problem. One is just to write a complete, uh, specific disable sequence for hardware takeover, which is just duplicated code. Or second solution is uh, what I actually implemented. I just read out the entire hardware state and map it into our software state tracking. The nice benefit of that approach is that after each mode set, I can read out the hardware state again and check, cross-check the actual hardware state with what I think it should be, which uh, helped uh, tremendously in, in developing the, the patch series because Every time something got lost, I had tons of worn back traces because the hardware state didn't match up with my software state tracking. Or if I had none of these, but still a problem, I knew exactly there was most likely some missing call somewhere that didn't update the state correctly because, yeah. So, kind of the immediate benefits of the new framework is uh, massively reduced mode set state space. Uh, like I said, the DPMS state uh, simplification was a large part to that. We just handle on and off. 
the second part of why it's massively simplified is the output staging, which really makes the DPMS offs case symmetric in the low level code with the uh, the mode set disable a, a pipe thing. The other thing is thanks to the hardware state, we don't have an, an ill-defined state at boot up. We had quite a few state tracking thingies in our code that said, well, we don't quite know what's going on, just disable everything. So all these special cases in the code that, that mark the hardware state as unknown kind of disappeared. And our last but not least, we could reduce tons amounts of hacks that just like double check whether the thing was actually still on because the CRTC had a helper like to call disable too often or kind of other things. Now we really have like one tr state transition from on to off and off to on and nothing else could ever or should ever go wrong. And the second thing I, I already kind of said about that hallway stage checking is awesome. Like really. I, usually when I got a bug report from other people that tested the thing before I merged it, I just ask for demask with all the debug splattered things put in and for a detailed description and then went about looking where we where exactly things got lost. And yeah, that pretty much worked out. Um the other thing was I mean, up to now, all the drivers use the CRTC helper framework. And the idea kind of is that you can pick and choose from that thing so that the, th the, the DRM core never gets in the way. It just directly calls in the driver. And you can use the CRTC helpers to implement that. So let's look a little bit at whether the intention of that actually worked out and how uh, clean the, the helper API is. One thing I noticed, the entire detect, hot plug detection thing and, and kind of uh, setting up the list of valid modes is, is very cleanly separated from everything else. And I, I didn't have to touch anything there. So that's really all talking also. Kind of if you plan to do something like that for your own driver, you can just replace that independently. There doesn't seem to be uh, any cross section with the other hand. The next thing was kind of the FP helper code, which which allows us to, with a few lines of code, set up an FP con on top of KMS. I really like to poke in CRTC helper internals. For example, it just called at various points uh, that disable all unused functions directly. So the i950 mode set code still has all the disable uh, callbacks implemented as no ops. So that things don't blow up. The other thing, it, a few other examples was like it for DPMS or console blanking, it just called directly the, the, the CRTC helper implementation instead of going through the uh, V table. So we uh, blanking on the FPCon didn't work anymore in between. One thing is the semantics actually implemented by the CRTC helper kind of fun and to add insult to injury, the FP helper actually depends upon that. One, one funny example is if you supply a mode set with a valid mode, a valid frame buffer, and a valid CRTC but no outputs, the CRTC helper does nothing, and the FP helper depends upon that behavior, otherwise you get a black screen. So I had to kind of fake that, uh, <laughs> that peculiarity in my own code. But uh, yeah, I'll look into cleaning that up. I mean, the current code obviously removes all the direct calls to the uh, CRTC helper where I need them, but there's some more cleanup to be done there. Um, there are also some WTF moments, obviously. One thing is the CRTC helper right after a mode set, there presumably everything is on, does a DPMS on call. Do not ask me why, it seems to be totally unnecessary. The strange thing on the, hand, on the other hand though is that it doesn't update the user visible uh, attribute for DPMS state. 
So we, we do. Pardon? I presume it. The thing is, you can actually disable and then uh, change the DPMS state while the CRTC is off. So it just keeps that around. And then you do a mode set call. The kernel's uh, state tracking, uh, yeah, enables everything. It presumes that the, the internal DPMS state tracking actually is on, but the user space visible thing is whatever it was before. Yeah. Yeah, that's we 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 have a f especially around the display pool code. We had tons of triple state keeping of DPMS just to make really sure that we get it wrong. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. That, that was one thing I guess I, I, I need to, to put out an RF, or RFC patch to change that so that we uh, at least update the user space visible DPMS property correctly because that's what I950 now does. The other thing which is kind of, what the heck is that implemented that way? The, the CRTC helper just disables any disconnected outputs. So if you like plug out, pull, pull out your DP cable do a mode set that and pull it, plug it down and in again, it's gone. We, 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 yeah. So that's that's actually still implemented in R950, but I think we should change that. Uh, I tried to dig around in, in the git, git commit history and I didn't quite figure out why we do that. I guess the only sensible explanation is that display port re link retraining was at one point of time probably broken and somebody used that hack to fix it. I don't know. I need to dig into that one. And the other thing is kind of, I think the, the helpful point is for the V-table should be typed. I mean, we, we have that nice pretension that it's just a void pointer and you can do whatever you want with it. But truth be told, you can't use anything else than CRTC helpers. So maybe we should stop lying to ourselves there. So now that the kind of basic thing is, is implemented, we still have a lot left to do. One thing is uh, clean up the FP helpers. Uh, this, yeah, the helper libraries a little bit, kind of try to decide on somewhat saner semantics try to clean up the FB helper a little bit so that it doesn't do these stupid modes that calls and expects them to do nothing. That, that's one part. I haven't gotten around to that yet quite. The next one is, I kind of started with that already in the common code, but then figured out that it's too much pain and we don't have enough flexible flexibility. I guess we'll move the hot plug handling into the driver too. Because on the Intel, we have a few peculiarities, like we have a shared hot plug pin between HDMI and DisplayPort, but actually two different like encoded things in hardware. And on top of that, if you have an enabled DisplayPort and you try to do HDMI edit reading, some DisplayPort panels get rather angry. Same, same is true if you, if you try to do a, a DP aux transaction while HDMI is running. So I think we, we need to move that into driver code, teach it some smarts. The other thing is with the hot plug is also, if you have any connector where we need to do like polling, the current common code polls every connector, which is a little bit of overkill and cause, causes trouble for those connectors where we actually have reliable hot plug detection. But I fear that that actual paper is over some box in various drivers. So I think it's probably safer to do that step by step in the driver where we can add tons of hacks and, and workarounds. The next thing is kind of atomic mode set. I don't want to spill too many words here about that one because we'll have a later talk, I think, from Rob about that. But one thing is we have shared PLL, shared links between the north and south bridge where we need to push pixels through. And that pretty much all depends on the clock. Currently, we like disable everything, do the mode set, try to allocate these resources, notice that we lack a PLL and give up. 
undo the da damage. And my plan here is to kind of move all the clock computation codes out and up so that we can decide about these resource allocation issues up front. That should also clean up the code quite a bit because a lot of the clock computations are uh, encoder specific, but currently we do that in the pipe uh, mode set call because we need to do some other things due to encoder specific ordering issues that don't get cleaned up. But hopefully we can clean up that mess. And yeah, last point, we have crafting crap and stupid things in the era of my 950 that kind of piled up over the time just to work around the issues with the FB helper. So there's still a few patches left today. Another thing that I noticed while developing is kind of who's responsible for actually keeping the mode set state around. And the way that I discovered that was kind of funny. I tested that thing, everything both pretty nicely. Until I discovered that, well, we do a force resume using the CRTC helper code at resume time. And I do not implement these callbacks anymore. How the hell does that sense the void? I, I later on noticed that because I disable everything at suspense time to kind of question the hardware and avoid to save and restore bogus uh, mode set state, I noticed that because the, desk, the backlight was actually turned on before we did any mode set because we just restored the active backlight control register. So I quiescent that on, on suspend time, so nothing actually is enabled at resume time, so nothing gets called, so that's the why I get, got away with it. But then I kind of asked myself, why the hell do I still have a display at, after resume? Because I just killed the restore code. And then I noticed we actually depend upon the FB con to restore things. And for the X server, we depend up on the VT switch to restore things. So I, I think if you ever get around to killing FBCon and the VT subsystem, uh, we have some things to answer there and figure out who's actually responsible for restoring that thing. The other thing is kind of, with all that stage tracking, I, I keep a second set of the entire mode set or of large points of the mode set state. And I guess it'll, it'll only grow once we move around the PLL code and clock code and bandwidth code to the right place in the driver itself. Now, for the atomic mode set, I kind of don't know yet whether we should reuse these state pointers in the driver or whether some common state may, uh, state tracking keeping thing for, for kind of preparing a new mode configuration makes sense. So I guess we'll, we'll just have to look there how the code actually looks and various drivers implement and maybe extract some helper code. Because yeah, that's that's kind of the entire copy paste thing I say, the mode set sequence itself is pretty I915 a specific, so there's not much duplication there. But kind of the prepare state that gets the the ioctal values and computes the new the side output configuration looks a little bit like duplicated code, so just something to keep in mind. The next thing is kind of a fast boot. I mean, it's on a, such an EDP panel, a mode set takes like one to two seconds, which is an eternity on like a tablet. So we try to, we, we would like to avoid that somehow. and. The current new mode code kind of goes a, a large way in the right direction because we now can correctly at least read out and take over the output routing and configuration. But there's still, we also already have patches on the mailing list from Chris Wilson to take over the pre-allocated uh, frame buffer that the buyers of firmware uses in, in stolen memory so we can just take over the frame buffer too, but there's still a lot of things left to do. We we need to kind of perfectly read out the PLL co uh, settings and especially the sharing 
so that we don't actually accidentally kill some things. Uh, we also have reference clocks that need specific settings depending on how the output how, how the outputs are currently enabled, and we just use a static setting for that. I guess the bias is slightly more flexible. Uh, currently, we also have panel fit. For example, the bias, the Intel BIOS really likes to set up the panel fit if you have an interlaced HDTV, a 1080i TV. So it uses a, a progressive frame buffer and uses the panel fit to upscale that. We currently support the panel fitter only on integrated panels, so we need to have some checks there at least that n no panel fitter is getting in the way, interlaced mode. So to really take over the bias configuration and avoid the mode set at boot up, we have still some work to do there, but I uh, say things are moving forward and be, yeah, moving to the right direction at least. The other thing kind of in the future is uh, multi-stream display port. Rumor tells me there is actually no shipping device, or at least no shipping sync. And the thing is there kind of, you have one, currently we have like one pipe CRTC with potentially multiple encoders uh, reading pixel from that. With multi-stream display port, you kind of have one display port encoder and multiple pipes feeding into that. So it's kind of the reverse. Um, I thought a little bit about how we could implement that so that the entire rewrite wasn't totally for naught. And I guess one way to do it is to just treat the display port encoder as a shared, shared resource and do a reference count of how many pipes actually use it. We have the exact that same code for the PLLs, the shared PLS, so that we don't disable things while someone else still uses them. And the other thing is, we could just uh, group the pipes and move uh, the responsibility of the platform-specific code not to just enable one pipe, to, but to enable an entire pipe group. So that's kind of the two ways forward, I see there. The code is kind of somewhat prepared for the pipe grouping already because I keep an entire mask of all the pipes that need changing. For ex I c also kind of as a preparation for more clever bandwidth selection uh, code. For example, if, if you enable another pipe and you notice that you don't have enough bandwidth, you might need to enable that ring and tune down the bits per color a little bit on another pipe. So the code, at least its structure, allows you to set a few other bits so that you can change uh, bandwidth uh, requirements for other pipes, and maybe we can uh, reuse that for multi-stream display pool if our uh, hardware ever ships. Uh, the last thing, yeah, I mean, it's display port. It's People hate it for a reason. Um, the last thing, kind of, when I sent out a blog post about all this stuff, explaining a little bit the reasoning about it, that somehow ended up on some BSD forums. And people started screaming about, you're destroying all our hard porting book. And, well, where is it? Wrong. I'm sorry. Because, yeah, we need it, and either you can keep up with porting or not. So, questions? Oh, yeah, mate. So I'm a little confused why there are even two copies of the DPMS state. Why not just let the driver track it and let the user land pull it out of the driver when it needs it? Well, one copy is kind of the public attribute, which is in the attribute code. The next copy is in the connector state, so, because yeah, the attribute is kind of that separate thing. And I guess the idea there is that this should reflect the actual harvest state. At least that's how I use it now. So I store the, the actual harvest state that we selected in there. 
and that's pretty much the current DPMS state that the new code has. The old code had like other DPMS state where we added like unknown to take over the bias correctly. We had DPMS state for encoder and pi because they were all kind of independent. And some of the tracking got confused because yeah, at the disabled side, we couldn't compute correctly which connectors are still connected on that pipe and hence cross-check the DPMS state. So that also resulted in some duplication. But yeah, it's pretty much gone now. We have some derived state at the encoders and CRTCs just to uh, simplify the code so that we don't need to loop over all the connected things all the time. But that's just convenience and the, the state tracker does double check that with the real computed state and the actual hardware state and complains if any of these three don't match up. So um, the new hardware state tracking that makes um, so improves the reduction of flickering. For example, my old um, laptop with GM45 has almost 10 times flickering, so very short flickering after XFC desktop comes up, or it doesn't help for such a case. What do you mean if if you change the configuration that things go off, on, off, and then you have kind of the new thing? No, no, no. It's just, just a laptop display. And it's, yeah, short flickering at each time X around out it's cold. Um, well, it doesn't really fix any bugs in our code currently. Yeah. Or at least not the rework itself. It only kind of allows us to fix. But if you, if you currently have like a, a training issue with a link somewhere or a bandwidth issue or we're doing something stupid somewhere that angers the hardware, mm. that, that will still be the same. Okay, but, okay then that, in that case it doesn't help. Um, then another question is, uh, well, my concern is um, it's possible regression on, especially on old hardware. Um, how well is it covered by the new uh, the test, test coverage of on hardware? I, I have tons of old hardware. Essentially, oh. but yeah, uh, I noticed that uh, some of the checks do fire actually in an old hardware. So I guess maybe we even lock in can fix a few really old box and really old hardware. Mm -hmm. There seems to be something going wrong somewhere. Okay, um, I'm asking that because we have tons of, for example, old. Um, Post system based on 8555, and that, yeah. I have one of those at home. <laughs> and so. also, yeah, we have many GM45 laptops and so on. Um, so, that from the, for example, from distribution point of view, so what we can help, for, for example, if, if we have, if we have um, broken hardware by the, so by the new mod set code, then how can I help? you the debugging except for sending a patch? Um, well, straight, the mode set rework shouldn't introduce any regressions. No. I mean, I tried really hard to not break anything, including stupid cloning and that kind of things that I don't really see a point in keeping working. Um, the, the regressions that popped up have essentially been two kinds. One was something went wrong in the mode set state code itself and then I had uh, hundreds of warns back traces because things didn't match up anymore yeah. and those are rather easy to fix and the other thing was just like FP help with doing something stupid okay. Thank you. so I'm rather positive that it will not blow up to add something to Takashi's question, actually, uh, my impression was that, that a lot of the issues with, with mode setting on the older hardware were actually related to all those workarounds uh, for things in the helper layer that that didn't work. So they things may actually start magically work now. Well, actually, they're not that many workarounds. I mean, the real reason why I started doing this and not just talking about it, was the, the EDP on this machine. 
and EDP is pretty new. So I think the only strange, crazy thing on old hardware is, is the LVDS pin pair thing and that work around. It's been there since forever. So it seems to work. Hopefully. Although Chris Wilson said that I managed to magically fix his 855 if he closes the lid so we can now enable the LVDS on that dead old machine. I don't know why. I have one T. That's not enough. You need to strike at two places. <laughs> Same time, preferably. Well, actually, 845 is quite commonly used, maybe not in laptops, but uh, we've plenty of pass machines where we still see this old hardware. Well, 845 is a disaster because the TLB is broken on that thing, so with anything dynamically managed memory, it's going to blow up. Y you need DRI1 and UMS for that. It's not going to be good otherwise. But 855 works. Oh, any other? Any further questions? Okay, if not, um, maybe we have 15 minutes um, to the next talk, and if we want to have a start in time. Keith, do you think we can use this time for uh, a release planning, the 15 minutes? Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. And I'll just...